I'm Stanford Carpenter, and this is the San Diego Comic-Con um, Con From Home panel on diversity in comics brought to you by the Black and Brown Comic Arts Festival. Um, I'm going to introduce you quickly to our panelists, and uh, yes, we're going to have a conversation about diversity in comics. Um, first, I would like to, I'd like to introduce Erica Hardison. She is the creator of Fabulize Magazine. Next, I'd like to introduce um, Frederick Aldama. He is, a he is a professor at University of Texas at Austin and also an Eisner Award winner. I'd like to introduce Nikki Rodriguez. She is, um, she's a webcomic artist. And Deborah Whaley, a professor at University of Iowa. <laughs> and David Walker, who writes comics. <laughs> you know, I, 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 if we were in person, I just have to say, because some of you know me, some of you don't, I'd be like, I'd be getting the crowd just screaming right now. It'd be like, I'd be up and pumping my fist up. So just imagine that that's all <laughs> so <laughs> so With your yeah. daishiki on, don't forget that your daishiki you always wear your daishiki at piano you know i should be wearing one right now i don't what was i thinking you know oh, and uh, i actually have a picture of you in your daishiki at a san diego comic-con well if there's a picture of me at san diego comic-con i'm in a daishiki pretty much <laughs> it's that's like my uniform and they're all in the closet behind me but <sighs> they've been retired during COVID. I should, um, but I've also increased my collection. So I'm looking forward to going back to cons in person so you can all see me in them. Well, and that's- I'm feeling silly this morning, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> and that, that's one of the things that, that's one of the things that, 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 that's really interesting. I mean, this is our, this is our second year in a row of having to do Comic-Con from home, right? All, a lot of the states are opening back up. A lot of the cities are, are opening back up. We're now we're now caught up in in um, in this movement towards trying to get vaccinated. There are people on planes, and lots of them are fighting and hurting each other. Um, but um, but yeah, we're, we're we're kind of in this transition where we're not quite out. Um, and so so I'd like to kind of I'd like to kind of st kind of start off with. Um, sort of a general question of how are you guys doing and what are you guys doing to manage to, to, to manage being connected to a field, that being comics, that is incredibly isolating, isolating, being a person of color who would be isolated even if we were not in a pandemic, right? Um, so, so let's, let's start there and let's, let's talk about Let's talk about where we're at now and, and, and what it's been like getting to here. Uh, who spoke? I'm not answering that first. Not me. Okay, I'll answer first. There you uh, go. See, that's what I wanted. <laughs> um, I'm not okay. I'm a first time mom. I have a toddler, a very active toddler. Um, while I appreciate that I'm in a position where I can still work from home and generate income, it is very challenging because there is no home life balance. Everything is like a long blur, you know, and people, you know, are still trying to function like we're not in a pandemic, which is very difficult. But at the same time, because of the pandemic, I have received, you know, a few opportunities that I might have not gotten without the pandemic. You know, I think the pandemic has allowed us to reassess what's important in life our purpose, you know, where are we going? Where do we want to go? Um, it also has, you know, have us evaluating ourselves. Like who is really important in our lives? What's important in our lives? What really makes us happy? We're sitting in the house all the time. You know, what is keeping us together um, as, as individuals or creatives or whatever uh, work that you do? And because of the pandemic, you know, I was able to write my first comic. I've never written a comic before. I'm, I'm just a journalist. <laughs> and I was like, kind of like, F it. We're all in the house, <laughs> you know? Um, if it's 
terrible it's a terrible comic but at least I got over the initial fear because there was a lot of fear of doing something that I'm used to being on the opposite end of I'm used to just reporting on comic book writers I'm used to interviewing comic book writers um, attending cons and you know reporting on analysts and you know diversity but to actually be in the driver's seat to write one was a different experience for me and um, because of the pandemic I was able to be like you know f fear I'm just gonna do it and um, we'll see what happens <laughs> I, 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 you know, I have to agree with just about everything Erica just said because, um, you know, there's it, it's there's the, been the isolation. There's been um, for me like a level of anxiety, both about the the you know the anxiety that comes from the grief of everything that we had to give up in the last you know. 14, 15 months. And then now the anxiety of where we're moving forward, right? It's like, what's it going to be like to be with people in real life? Um, and for me, you know, Stanford, you talked about this sort of isolated world that each of us lives in as, as a creative person, which is true. But at the same time, like, I can think of there's been at least five times in the last 15 months that I normally would have seen you normally would have seen John. There's at least one or two times I normally would have seen Frederick that I haven't seen. And, and I realized like that that convention world is is sort of crucial to who I am. I never realized how crucial it was to who I am until it was all taken away from me, right? Um, but I'm also realizing that, that my world has expanded in, way, in, a, in a virtual way. Uh, panels like this, you know, Zoom, all of these sort of things that have allowed me to meet some people that I haven't met before, or connect in ways with people that, you know, um, that maybe were connected through social media, like like with Erica, but not really talking sort of face to face as as Zoom allows us. Um, but uh, and Erica said something that was so profound to me, talking about that um, writing her first comic, going from being a journalist. To, to writing comics, which is very similar to the path that I, I've been on, but also the trans, the, like the professional and personal transitions I've gone through over this year of, of sort of reassessing like, okay, what kind of legacy do I want next? What are, what's the work that I wanna put out there next? How do I wanna help other people uh, realize their potential? And so, you know, I'm, I'm to a point now where I'm really trying to find and I've been this way for, for quite some time where I'm trying to find the positive in all that we've collectively gone through as a society because the, the, the negative is so obvious, right? And, and but without the positive, you know, you fall in, you, you just turn into a, a terrible person. So I'm trying to be a better person. Nikki, how about you? How is, how is your work? How's this affected your work and in, 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 in your life? Yeah, I mean, um, kind of speaking on the conventions, it made me realize how uh, how essential that was to me because I used to be an after-school teacher before COVID, um, but I would still regularly go to a lot of uh, zine fests, especially because there's so many in the Bay Area. Um, but because of the pandemic, um, I had to move, so I no longer live in California. I live in Colorado right now. Um, and even though I've been trying to do a lot of virtual zine fests as they pop up, it's just like, it's just not the same. Like I really enjoyed like being in a new place, seeing all these other artists and just like seeing all the new work out there. Just having that like in-person experience was really like visceral for my creativity. Um, so having that just kind of like taken away so suddenly and like not really knowing when I'll be able to travel again or like see other members of my zine community family and things like that was definitely hard to get used to and I know there are some zine fests that are like slowly starting to do like partially in person but like programming will be like online but they'll have like a little pop-up thing that you could drive up to um but it's just like so up in the air the I think the pandemic has done a lot of like wild things to my life, unfortunately, but like one kind of like silver lining is I've been able to actually work on like pitches and start querying agents, which is something I couldn't really do the past couple of years just by nature of like 
my focus was on lesson planning. So I was like, I don't want to be typing up query letters anymore if I've already spent hours making lessons for kids. Um, so I've been able to really hone in on some of my like long form fiction comics, which is something I've been putting off for a while. So I've really enjoyed that aspect, but I'm also just excited and hoping for the day that I could like start traveling for zine fests again, even if it's just like traveling around Colorado first. I can jump in next. Yeah, so I, I've been doing uh, fairly well. I think one of the things that has kept me going is I've been doing a lot of talks and a lot of panels on comics um, and sequential art. So I've been, you know, connected to the community uh, in that way. And um, I'm also lucky because although I, I live in Iowa, Iowa City, Iowa, I, I came out to Arizona last year for spring break, right? And then lockdown happened in the pandemic. So I ended up being able to stay here in Arizona uh, with family. So, so that's been great. Um, so it hasn't been as isolating as it would have been had I, um, you know, stayed in, in Iowa. Um, but I think uh, Another thing that kept me going, especially this past spring semester, is I taught a course on the Black image in comics, graphic novels, and anime, uh, an undergraduate course. And we met at uh, it was 7.30 in the morning for me and 9.30 in the morning for them. And I had 19 students, so they were very dedicated and they were very on it. And so I was able to have these really, um, you know, great conversations, had great students. And then at the same time, I uh, did a community course, which I've never done before teaching uh, a course where just members of the community um, are your students. And uh, the course I taught was on the black image in film, particularly looking at uh, comics. And so that was really neat too, because I was doing the undergraduate course, but then I was conversing with these adults who were just like taking this night class, you know, one night a week to, um, to, to talk about the black image in film, um, particularly uh, comic book, anime, and uh, superhero characters. And I actually, I, I taught um, David's book and um, uh, Marcus Kwame Anderson's book uh, in my undergraduate course. And um, Marcus came in to talk to my class. So that was a lot of fun. And uh, another thing that I did talking about, um, you know, Marcus uh, coming to my class, he did this great book um, with David. I had other comic artists and writers uh, drop into my class and zoom in. And so, those are some of the ways I was able to uh, to stay connected. But I mean, despite all that, you know, it's it's still a pandemic <laughs> and there's still all these crazy things happening um, in the larger public sphere um, in terms of, you know, politics and um, social relations and all that crazy stuff going on in the world, too. So, so I'll jump in as the last one here. Um, all right. Let's just call it for what it is. I mean, the pandemic ripped through the social tissue that was already fraying greatly for communities of color in this country. Suddenly everybody's like, what? Oh, you guys are having a hard time over there? Hell yeah, right? It's like, damn, it takes a pandemic for the mainstream media to put its focus on that we've been, excuse me, that our families and communities have been dealing with forever. Okay, so like, let's just, you know, be honest and open here, you know, this isn't new. It's just that it put a magnifying glass on all the kinds of stuff that we have been dealing with. Our, you know, like my dad, difficulties of getting vaccinated all the way to the end. Part of it, the kind of weird, like, conspiracy theories that he's been eating up that are out there, right? That this is gonna put a magnet in his system or whatever, all that kind of weird stuff. I mean, from that to just access, from the brutalities that continue to face our communities, finally people paying attention, we'll see how long David was talking about like an anxiety about what's to come. Like, you know, will this, last i mean you know suddenly marvel dc all these people are like putting a focus on diversity will it last is it deep is it systemic right okay <laughs> um a couple on a personal note SoulCon, my brown and black comics um festival bipoc festival that i've been doing for a while that david stanford many of you've been at um that went virtual 
there are some silver linings like you guys talked about bringing in folks that wouldn't have normally been able to come. I'm really glad for that because I'm going to, I'm hoping we learn something there in terms of the virtual and we can do some of that in our in-person cons in the future. Um, so that was really liberating. But on the flip side, you know, I have a huge outreach program, the Latinx Space for Enrichment um, Research. And Deborah, I'm so glad to hear that things worked with your community um, course because um, I have about, I have 13 different hubs across the city of Columbus um, this year and they didn't survive. They did not survive. You know, for high school kids to get access, to get online once a week was just impossible. I mean, there were a few, they would park outside of libraries, they would try to connect outside of, you know, public spaces where there was internet. But for the most part, you know, that my big community outreach program over 10 years long, um, it, it didn't survive. It's, um, you know, it's, it's interesting. I'm glad Frederick was able to, he went where I want to go, but I've been trying not to because, you know, my blood pressure and everything. Um, but it's, it, it is, it's, it's, um, as, as a middle-aged man, I never thought I could be angrier than I was when I was in my, you know, late teens and early twenties. Um, but between the pandemic and, and a lot of what we've seen, um, and the socio-political sphere in this country has has infuriated me in ways that I never thought was possible, and and it's I'm almost self-conscious about some of the work that I'm doing because I feel like oh it, it, is this I never used to think is this too angry is this too but I've hit that age where I'm like oh maybe I'm a little I'm a little too radical you know um, but again the the to to go back to that silver lining of it all. Um, there's people I know I absolutely never would have connected with um, had the had the world not gone into the toilet, right? And and um, I was I was talking to a friend the other day, and I said, you know, uh, depression is rooted in 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 the past, and anxiety is rooted in the future. Um, we get depressed because we think too much about the past. We get anxiety because we think too much about the future. So we have to find balance in the present. And, and, and that's part of what I'm working towards. And, and, and I think to myself, like right now there's, I was talking to my friend's kid who's just turned 14, just filled with anger and anxiety over, over essentially being robbed of, of, of going out and being social. And then on top of that, all the indignities that are heaped upon uh, people of color and marginalized folks that, that this kid is experiencing. And I, I think to myself, okay, what can I do as this angry middle-aged person to help so that that teenager that I'm talking to today will not still be as angry as he is 40 years from now? And, and so again, y'all caught me on a good day because I'm sort of feeling the sunshine and rainbows, right? And, uh, but, but never mistake that for the, the fact that there's a lot of anger going on here and, and seeing like that in so many ways we have not come nearly as far as, as, as the most optimistic people want to think we've come, right? Every, everything that's wrong with the society has been exposed. And, and for some of us folks who are a little bit older or have done a bit more, it's, it's like, okay, well, our time's not done yet. We still can make a difference. And that's, I think that goes back to the conversation we we're having even before we started recording is like, you know, the, the work is, is not, just because there's a vaccine doesn't mean the disease has gone away. Just because people now know or have heard the term systemic racism doesn't mean systemic racism has gone away. Yeah. Well, I yeah, I'm fine to, to jump in. And maybe a good way to answer that is to address some of the things that Stanford brought up um, and Erica as well in terms of like, has the social, cultural, political landscape changed because of COVID and things that are going on in the public sphere um, in terms of these like, you know, public altercations and um, killings, murder, you know, however you want to frame it, of people of African descent, but also, you know, Asian and Asian Americans and all this violence that's going on. Um, in the public sphere, it seems like people are definitely paying attention to it. And I think um, the difference between like, for example, me teaching my um, Black Image and Comics course 
uh, this past spring and the first time um, I taught it. So this past spring, I had a um, really diverse group of students um, and there were several of my students who identify as dominant culture, identified, you know, um, uh, white who said, you know, I took this course, I'm interested in comics, but I'm also, I thought it was a safe way to talk about race and, um, you know, learn more about African American culture, but maybe it's not as threatening as, let's say, you know, other courses I teach on African American history. <laughs> and I thought that was really interesting. It was both um, disappointing, um, but also, uh, it, you know, it, it was good in that I saw the power of teaching media and popular culture as a way to sort of um, address some things and get people to the table and get people interested who may not um, otherwise uh, feel comfortable um, talking about these issues. So it's really wonderful to be able to, you know, cover culture, politics, history, and all of that through sequential art um, and the graphic form. On the other hand, you know, kind of, um, connecting Stanford and Erica's uh, points. I just, you know, and also something that David brought up too, I, I, I don't know how real and long lasting all of this attention is. I feel like it's already waning. Um, and even the degree to which people are wanting to see more aware, or they're seeking out other voices and other um, forms of knowledge, is it really chipping away at the social political structure and changing everyday social relations? And so that's something that I'm always um, invested in um, thinking about and, and intervening in. So I remain always hopeful, but, um, you know, a skeptic uh, at, as well. So, yeah. yeah. There's nothing wrong with being a skeptic. I, I, I've, I've survived this whole time doing that. So it's it's difficult. It really is. And and I think that the, the for me, the, the truth is like, yeah, it, all you can do is just keep going, right? There's the, the you there's what you believe in and there's what you want and and if you don't get it, you keep going. There there's like giving up is not an option as far as I'm concerned. This is how I was raised, right? There's plenty of time to sleep when you're dead. That's it. There's plenty of time to you know to rest and not fight when when they plant you in the ground, but um if, if, if you see something that's wrong, if you see an injustice or, or an imbalance even, then you have to do something about it. Um, I kind of like that you just brought up that note, David, because it made me kind of like think on how through the pandemic, I've been able to have more opportunities to like speak to college courses and just through different um, panels and, and like libraries and things like that, that I couldn't do when I was traveling for zine fest just by nature of like the cost restrictions or like the locations of them and also being like a small up-and-coming zine stir anytime i was in a zine fest it was like a really great opportunity for me to like be immersed in that space but i also felt like i if there was something wrong that i was seeing in terms of like how people are being represented especially like whenever i'm going to space that like markets itself as being like latinx specific but there is like a dominant uh, culture there. And then you're like the token Caribbean person and everyone's just coming at you with all these questions and making it clear that they're like ignorant to the existence of like who you are and your work and things like that. But at the same time, I'm like, well, I don't want to like put off any people and lose my chance to like be in a space anywhere else necessarily. Like, I don't want to shoot myself in the foot, I guess, but because I'm able to do things virtually now, I kind of like built up the confidence to be able to discuss the fact that like within the monolith of Latinidad, it's just like so homogenizing and it's kind of frustrating, especially like thinking about my friends who are Afro-Latino, who are Central American, who are Caribbean and the things happening with like Puerto Rico being a colony and just like the absence of so many of those narratives whenever we're in these spaces. Cause I definitely felt like oh man, I don't wanna do another diversity panel because I'm gonna get the same questions over and over and over again. And like, I feel like that happened a lot every time I did something in person, but what's nice about like it being virtual is I feel like I'm not talking with the same one or two people that I was always talking to on these panels. Now I'm actually like seeing more voices, more artists and things like that. And really able to kind of like push the subject of like, we need to stop trying to 
like create this image that there is like one constructed Latino, Latina person because all the histories and cultures that we come from have so much nuance. And if we're like being super reductive and saying like basically repurposing stereotypes that have already been used against us as a way to like unify us and still excluding so many people, it's like really frustrating being in those spaces. So I like that I've been able to like have these opportunities to discuss that a lot more. Um, and it's just like helping me like open up opportunities, um, not even just for myself, but also my friends to just like be like, you can have these conversations too. Like it's an interesting silver lining having everything be virtual like this because it really did like weirdly enough, like diversify just like the voices that were able to have the access to participate in these discussions. And it like allowed me the chance to kind of open up a new branch of that conversation in terms of like what it means to like be Latinx and like what that monolith does to so many people who feel excluded despite kind of also falling under that Latinx umbrella. Pause. Are we waiting for someone to say something? Like, that was good. That was like a good. That was a good mic drop thing. Right yeah. <laughs> um, I think we have to keep having these conversations um, because I'm also in kind of in the book publishing industry. I review books and things like that for different platforms, and a lot of public libraries or even you know private libraries. You know, they have donors and trustees and things like that the trustees, the people with all the money and the influence, they are actively removing uh, books that talk about race, gender, sexuality, and libraries. This is something that is happening and it's continued to happen. And, you know, we have to keep talking about it because if we don't talk about it, they're going to take all of our literature. Like we've been, I feel like collectively we've been, we've done so much to decolonize our bookshelves, to introduce more um, diversity literature for younger readers, because that's really where the important work is, is with the younger readers, like, you know, between kindergarten and, and, and high school, they need to read books with characters that look like them, something they can relate to, experiences they can relate to, you know, they don't need to read, you know, the same white male literature <laughs> all throughout school. So while there are a lot of people who are actively trying to decolonize the bookshelves across the country, there are entities who have the monies and the mean that are stopping them from difference from the top, you know, from it's not from the bottom, they're doing it from the top. So next thing you know, they want to talk about race in school, they're going to revise history. I just want, I can't imagine what history books will say 10, 15 years from now, like when my daughter's in high school and she wants to ask me about Donald Trump, I can't even imagine the stories they're going to come up with to make it seem like it wasn't really all that bad. You know, it was just, you know, people were just, you know, overreacting because, you know, this is what's happening. And it's kind of, you know, really interesting to see in real time how history is being altered and changed to accommodate colonizers, I guess. Nikki in here for a second, but um, okay, there's a couple of things, Erica, like if you, the other day I was invited to be a respondent in an academic conference that was taking, that was shaped in London, but you know, and it was called Crisis Lines. And it was about like kind of documentary comics and issues of like detention camps and refugees and forced movement of peoples and so on. Um, and so it's weird because in the academy, I feel like they're, okay, for all of my colleagues, I love you, et cetera, but let me just say this, like there seems to be a, an, a sense of white academic needing to legitimate itself in and through the suffering of others and the kind of global other and the forced um, trauma of others. I'm just gonna say it, right, the way it is. That's an academic move to justify, to give value to your scholarship as someone kind of outside of this experience. Then there's intention with like 
or even the almost, and Deborah, you can chime in here too, like the erasure of um, there, David, others, like I've never read a superhero comic written by David or even the new one that I've just read, Justin Reynolds and Pablo Leon, this uh, you know teen middle grade Miles Morales shockwaves where we don't have history interwoven into this, this superhero space. I call it the ethno-racial pause in my kind of academic work, but like, I don't, I, that's like just the way it is. There isn't like a clear divide in, in my understanding and my experience of superhero comics of color. Now, let me move really quickly. Um, Stanford mentioned the big two, hey, we got to get back and see what Scholastic is doing. And the reason why Marvel partnered for the first time with Scholastic on this graphic novel by Justin Reynolds and Pablo Leon is because they're blowing the, t t the big two out of the water in terms of sales. Getting back to Erica's point about middle grade youth, and this is really the place for kind of our work. Um, but Nikki, I sent Nikki, um, I asked Nikki to send me some pages of this really incredible comic that she's creating about these, um, you know, these queer um, women of color. And Nikki, you can tell us a little more. I got it over to Scholastic and we have yet to hear back. This gets back to things like distribution, but what happens if you're not even seen? I mean, if there's no, if you're not seen, how are you gonna get distribution, right? So I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm glad you bring that up because when Erica was talking, it reminded me like recently in the Twitter sphere, like the whole discussion about the own voices kind of like terminology with publishing and how that ended up just like blowing up in everyone's face and just like the understanding or like how it kind of accidentally facilitated a lot of gatekeeping because of someone who's been like querying since like the start of the year finally it's like people want trauma narratives they want you to justify your trauma they want you to put that up front to be like I'm querying you because I'm this here's my sad sob story. I'm gonna make it sound super sad in this email so that way you could see it and hopefully put it out there so that way I could finally start selling my art. But then suddenly you're pigeonholed as like, okay, well, these are the only stories I'm gonna be able to tell. And that's something that's already happened to me many times whenever, like, again, just kind of through the whole conversations of like, what is diversity? And I wanna be a part of that conversation and be able to help broaden that scope to be inclusive of like more Caribbean voices but also, and colonial voices, um, just thinking about like the solidarity between like Hawaiians, Puerto Ricans and individuals in Guam and like American Samoa and like the Islanders solidarity between like our colonized histories. But at the end of the day, like within the monolith of Latinidad, I'm getting offers to like tell stories that are not mine because they think we all collectively share this history even though that is not the case at all. And it's really frustrating. And like when it comes to own voices, like that was very much, um, super problematic and like people didn't really see it at first but suddenly like we're getting these stories about how people are like being forced to come out and out themselves like whether they're trans or they're queer and just like they suddenly owe everyone their entire life story but only the people of color who this is like their first opportunity to be seen and now suddenly they're kind of like forced to hide back because they're like well now all my secrets are out there for everybody and that's not what I wanted. I just wanted to make a comic book <laughs> or something like that. And it's just really frustrating. Um, there's like another tangent <laughs> I'm getting at, but like I kind of lost my train of thought, but like that's very much what I thought of in this conversation is just like the idea that like we have to put our trauma first thing in order to be seen. Otherwise, like we have no opportunity to be seen period. Um, and how our voices can kind of just be interchanged of like, okay, well, you're Latinx, you could go ahead and tell someone else's story because we simply want like a Latinx person to like put out for the year to say like, oh, we're not publishing just white voices anymore. Um, so yeah, it's just really frustrating. And it's like, I like that the conversation about own voices is happening, but I still feel like there is a lot that needs to be done in order to move um, 
just to make change, especially because so many graphic novels are geared towards like YA and middle grade, but for anyone who wants to tell more adult stories, like this is a problem I'm running into because the idea of like adult as a term still specifically means something about like sexual content. Um, or like if you're telling a queer story, queer stories are somehow too adult, despite the fact that there are like children who are experiencing and understanding kind of like their queer identity through certain media they're seeing, but to be able to like have the chance to put more positive representation out there, especially for like cutie BIPOC individuals and their stories. And we're just like facing so many barriers in terms of like, who do these publishers want to publish? And also, do they even know how graphic novels work? Because that's like a whole other story in terms of like traditional publishing, trying to like figure out a graphic novel. And it's like, you look at all these listings for agents and they're just like, yeah, I take graphic novels as a genre. So you have no idea what that means. Cause you're like, well, it's not a genre. It's like, it's a format, it's a medium it, that like, come on. <laughs> like every time I see that, it's super frustrating. So I'm like, I don't know if a conversation is really going to get very far in terms of like being able to talk about the stories you want to tell. Yeah, I, I couldn't agree more. Um, I mean, Nikki, you bring up so many great points. And I think uh, one of the frustrations for me is that um, even in conversations about diversity uh, in popular culture in this form we're talking about, or just even more broadly in life, like you're saying, there's still this sort of dominant culture identified way of thinking about and seeing difference, right? In this really sort of safe way. Um, and I'm continuing to be disappointed at the lack of intersectionality. <laughs> and it's just so interesting, you know, I, uh, you know, as others of you were saying, you get uh, called upon to do panels on, on diversity or, you know, someone like myself, I do diversity uh, training um, on my campus, but it can only go so far. And sometimes it remains in this sort of safe box where you're not really able to talk about the multiplicity of identity and some of the more um, messier forms um, of identity that, that doesn't make people feel um, as safe. So that's always really frustrating for me. At the same time, I find myself in talking about difference and in comics, a lot of times the conversation will go to kind of like the big two versus the indie realm, right? And in the indie realm is where there's this, you know, great sort of transformative work going on. And then in Marvel and DC, you know, we're just continuing to get more of the same. And I think that that's absolutely valid um, in a lot of ways, but I've also been really excited about, and I know I keep talking about teaching and pedagogy. I always seem to sort of go there, but my students who are like not even really reading a lot of Marvel and DC and are reading a lot of like manga and looking at a lot of anime and they are looking at more independent stuff. Um, but at the same time, we have this explosion on television, right? Of DC and Marvel characters, of a diversification of what a superhero looks like. Like, uh, and, and a lot of times it's not necessarily, you know, perfect, still problematic, but I'm thinking about a character like um, Batwoman, right? You know, the CW's Batwoman, where so the first time we have this Black, you know, queer woman who is a superhero. And I don't think, you know, just because it's a, a sort of character that's, uh, you know, known and it's a superhero, that that type of representation, um, again, not perfect, but doesn't matter. And I think one of the things that's really exciting exciting about this time is that, you know, we do have that um, and we have Black Lightning and we've had the Luke Cages and, um, you know, I mean, some of these representations have been um, sort of a harking back to black exploitation and problematic in a lot of different ways, but I'm still really excited about talking about the ways in which there's been some shifts and transformations um, with the more sort of popular genres um, and characters and keeping that in conversation with these other realms too, where really exciting work um, is going on, but also trying to um, not kind of get stuck in that, that, that binary of, uh, you know, the popular, the big two, oppressive, and, and the indie realm is where all the great stuff's, uh, you know, uh, uh, going on. So those are some of the things that uh, I'm thinking about. It's, um, <clears throat> everybody's raising so many interesting points, valid points that I agree with. Um, and, and, the, and, and going back to what Erica was talking about, because um, every question Erica asked is something I'm, asking, talking about, like, how do we legitimize this medium more? How do we expand the, the um, possibilities of what we can do with nonfiction? How do we engage with young people more? I, I don't necessarily have that many 
answers. Sometimes I feel like I have the answers, but I don't. Um, but and and this is where I, you know, sometimes what I'm about to say will sometimes rub people the wrong way. But it's it's never meant um, in a dismissive or in a Republican pull your self up by your bootstrap sort of way, right? But it's in the, yeah, in, Erica, then just do it. You figure out how, how to do it and you do it. Nikki, you, you figure out how to do it and you just do it. Deborah, you figure out how to, you know, Frederick, we, this is what we've all been doing, right? In our own little ways, we don't realize that we're doing exactly what we're talking about doing. And then we hit sort of a roadblock of like, okay, um, you know, it, it, it's like if you're, you know, you, you, you've read every single Hardy Boys book and you're like, I've read all the Hardy Boys book. There's no more mysteries left to read. And it's like, no, there are plenty more mysteries left to read, right? And so we begin to explore and we, and we figure out it's, it's, it's that, that, you know, that Toni Morrison belief of if there's something that you want, um, you know, this is paraphrasing what Toni Morrison said, but if there's something that you want that you're not finding, how do you make it happen? How do you manifest it? How do you make it a reality? And, and the interesting thing is that, you know, each of us has done that in some capacity or another, because this is where we are. We've, we've, we've reached this point. And there, there comes a point where I think for a lot of us where it's, it's not enough, we have to move forward. And we're looking around and there aren't the role models or the examples that we need. And that's when we have to create them ourselves, right? We have to sometimes be that, that you know, whether it's the, the first person taking that step, and maybe it's not gonna be perfect. Maybe it's not gonna be exactly um, how we envision it, but until we do it, there, no one can, can build upon um, on, on whatever foundation we lay down. And it's, it's why, you know, um, you know, we can look at certain things that are problematic from, from eras past, but it's like, well, that problematic comic book or that problematic film is informing me right now as to what I don't want to do, right? I don't, I, I, I tell my students all the time, don't look at things that inspire you for what you want to do. Look at things that repulse you. Look at the things that you hate and go, I don't want to do that and then build from there, right? And, and, and especially for, for people of color and, and for um, marginalized folks, oppressed folks, um, that's some of the best way to do it is just to look at it and go, oh yeah, no, I, I don't want this anymore. How am I going to change it? And, and, I, and I think that that level of responsibility can seem overwhelming at times. And, and the only advice I can offer is you just, you, you do it in baby steps, right? If, 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 you, if you wanna figure out how to make the, the most important nonfiction epic graphic novels of all time, um, start out by doing like four page comics, right? Learn, learn what you need to do to get to where you need to be next. Because none of us, you know, I can't cook Thanksgiving dinner for anybody if I don't even know how to boil water, right? And, and so it's, it's learning that process, it's baby steps. It's, it's, and it's, and, and, and it's, it's not limiting yourself, but it's, it's recognizing the limitations that surround you and knowing how to navigate around them. So how do we gain the means of production? And so, you know, one of the things I'm thinking about, so we're sort of talking about putting um, counter narratives out there and, and you can do that. I'm, you know, I'm an artist, I do sort of graphic work and I paint um, as well. And I just recently um, attempted to do a comic about uh, what happened to George Floyd and that was rejected. <laughs> um, that's fine. But I mean, my point is, right, you can create these counter narratives, um, but what type of work needs to happen where we can gain the means of production so that we can put these narratives out in a way that's reaching the communities that we want to um, reach and that's making some type of intervention and I think you know before we were talking about legitimization and I stopped trying to legitimize uh, the fact that I do work on on comics and graphic novels are always calling it graphic novels because I don't want to say comics because people don't think that's important um, maybe that's easy for me to say because of where I'm at in my career but I also see myself as someone who's trying to kind of like open up the field for people who are coming, I don't want to say behind me, but also for, you know, younger scholars as well and trying to like blaze um, a trail. But I do think this issue of gaining the means of production and being able to um, publish these narratives and these counter stories is uh, something that continues to be 
uh, a problem. Yeah, I think what, you, what I, oh, Stanford, Stanford, before you jump in, let me just say yeah. um, Latino graphics, um, right, as my little tiny way of trying to kind of open that space for our creatives. Um, BCAF also, Stanford, maybe you want to mention something. I know Aaron is really pushing a big initiative through BCAF uh, to become something like this. Um, and, and to go back to David's point, um, you know, at a certain point, are we going to continue to be um, waiting around or are we just going to get together and figure out, gosh, you know, we have all this incredible talent and expertise. Let's, let's just figure this out on our own and do our, you know, let's do, do this on our own. Anyway. Pretty much what it is. So the only difference I see and that I've experienced is they just have more access to media than y'all. That's what it is. They have, they have the ABCs, they have the New York Times, they have all these editors' contacts they can send blasts to, right? And whoever responds, that's how they get their BuzzFeed, that's how they get all their placements and things like that. It's a really a PR thing, right? Um, as someone who publishes a magazine, it is very hard. But on the flip side, I'm writing for my community, right? I'm writing you know, there, there is no hose bars. If I think something is terrible, it's terrible. And my community, you know, entrusts in me to be honest with them, right? If I, if I meet someone who's a jackass, you know, I can say it without pushback because it's my yeah. magazine and it's the truth and my community appreciates it, pre appreciates it. Now, when it comes to resources, it is difficult, right? I mean, I made my magazine out of anger. I was tired of you know, going to the supermarket, I've been reading magazines ever since I was a little girl. And every magazine, doesn't matter who it is, doesn't even matter if it's like Michelle Obama on the cover, there is like no more than maybe 10 to 15 pages of black and brown people on it. And in any magazine, any issue, any year, <laughs> you know? And I was like, I, I'm tired of not seeing myself. I'm tired of not seeing black girls. You know, the most black girls I would see in the magazines in the hair magazine, right? I want to see black girls frolicking in the, the sun and picking flowers and, you know, doing all types of things like regular lifestyle content that I wasn't seeing. And I started off just making it for my friends. I wasn't pushing it out on social media. I was scared. And all of a sudden, like every time I put out, put out an issue, it would get bigger, shared more, more views, more requests, you know, more information. And then I landed a, a one issue I under interviewed, you know, former Senator Karamozi Braun. And I'm thinking to myself, if the former Senator of the United States is interested in my magazine, I feel like everybody is, right? Even though it might not be true, but the fact that, you know, another Chicago woman, you know, recognize someone from Chicago is putting a magazine together, a black magazine where she can speak freely and she feels more comfortable to talk about politics and, and, and black feminism and politics and things like that. That made me feel good. And I was like, you know what? Sometimes my issue might be a different, you know, where instead of a thousand people reading it, maybe only 500 people read it. But the point is that I'm doing it and it is serving a purpose. And I might not make, you know, be on the radar of New York Times or, you know, Fortune or, you know, Adweek, but there is a community who is dependent on it. So if you're, you know, you might not have the same placements as big publishers, or you might not get the TV spots or the interviews, but there is someone in your community that you're reaching out to and you're, you're talking to because your product is for someone in your community that's going to be appreciative of it. It could be a little girl, a little boy, a trans child who was like, hey, I read this, it's in my book bag every day. And you might not know me, but this piece of work really impacts me positively. And I think that's kind of like the guide I operate off of. I, I don't really operate off of, you know, what mainstream is going to nominate me or give me, you know, because if you're really creating something for your community, you know, you're not going to get the, the praise from white media, right? Because you are pretty much ousting them because you're not censoring them. And anytime you don't center, center whiteness, 
you really don't get the the, yeah. the praise of everything you want because you're not centering whiteness, especially when you're doing it unapologetically. Um, because white people like to see themselves. They'll say that race doesn't matter or they don't you know, care about color, but white people love to see themselves in everything, every single thing. That's why you know a lot of the best uh, black romances books or that gets pushed out a lot is the interracial ones, right? Because white people wants to see themselves, you know, even with historical fiction, like they're obsessed with these like slave love stories. It's, it's, it's like the thing is just obsessed with seeing themselves and they don't know that because for so long they've been the default so anything that derives away from the default scares them but that's a personal problem at least that's what I think it's a personal problem because you know you can't after so long you know people people matter and people need to see themselves just like you know black girls need to see natural hair they need to see themselves with natural hair and for so long, we was, you know, robbed of that. And now that we are not, we get to see like these beautiful hairstyles everywhere on fashion covers now in Vogue and stuff like that. So it's very important for especially young people, especially young black and brown children to see versions of themselves, whether it's at the supermarket, you know, at the beauty salon where your magazine or comic could be picked up at, or even at these cons where, you know, small indie people are selling cons and they're selling out to like little people, like little kids and families because they're the ones who need it the most. So I just want everyone to keep that in mind. Can I add something to like, um, just I don't know how much time we have Stanford, but really quick. Yeah, this is the, the last comment. It's yours. Okay, <laughs> really quick. Diversity panel, like Mark II, right? San Diego Comic-Con. And I wonder if maybe this is a moment for us to make a decisive turn away from talking about diversity in relation to whiteness and actually go back to some of our earlier points about intersectionality and colorism in our communities and queer phobia, fear of anxiety of like a brown and black queer tide rising. That in fact, diversity work right now um, may be in the most transformative and empowering ways, not only to recognize ourselves as creatives, as in, you know, folks really trying to carve new spaces within the industry space, but really to kind of take an honest look at what's going on within our communities. And I think this is a plug for BCAF. When BCAF decided to rebrand and open itself from Black Comics Arts Festival to Black and Brown, and also um, Indigenous kind of inclusive um, I think that that's maybe where we can be most productive in terms of our quote unquote diversity work, maybe. You just blew my mind. <laughs> that just, I, I'm gonna be thinking about that, that, that diversity. We need to stop talking about it as diversity as it relates to whiteness, but diversity within right. our larger world. Thank you so much.